Hello everybody and welcome to Storytime for Grown-Ups with the Wellington City Libraries. My name is Lee Murray and I'm an um, award-winning writer and editor and I live in um, beautiful sunny Bay of Plenty in Tauranga. Um, and uh, I'm here with my co-author and collaborator Dan Raybats who lives in Windy Wellington. And Dan is also an author, editor, screenwriter. He does a lot of things. He's the author of these amazing books here, Brothers of the Knife and Sons of the Curse. And we have the new one, Sisters of Spindrift, coming out very shortly um, in his Children of Bane series. So welcome, Dan. How are you tonight? Hello, Lee. Very nice to be here. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. And um, and all the same to you as well. I hope you're having a lovely night up there in Tauranga. Is it uh, uh, warmer than it is down here, I suspect? Uh Always warmer than it is down there in Wellington. Always. All right. So, um, so it's very nice to be here. Like I say, uh, uh, scary stories with Wellington City Libraries, and uh, and thanks to to the uh, Wellington City Library for inviting us aboard to um, to share a bit of a a bit of a scary story with you all. Uh, so tonight, what we would like to do is read you an excerpt from the third book in the series that uh, Lee and I have written. Uh, the book is called Blood of the Sun. The series is uh, The Path of Ra. The series is released by our Raw Dogs Screaming Press out of the USA. So this is the third book in the in the series. We, um, to give you a little bit of background, we have our brother and sister team, adopted brother and sister, um, Penny, and Matthew Yi, and they they are a bit of a, a bit of a, a crime fighting duo, if you like, um, who find themselves investigating uh, some. Now we have a little bit of a a tech noir crime thriller dystopian near future Auckland, uh, and so there's there's all sorts of strange goings on that our that our, our duo find themselves. In. Um, Lee, would you like to show us the cover now that we've looked at the other two? Ooh, yeah, the cover absolutely. The book. There it is. Can you see it? Have you got it on your screen? I have. It's a, it's a lovely thing. I, 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 I love. I love what they've done with the uh, with the red. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the cover? Yeah, this is a cover by award-winning cover artist Daniel Sierra from Italy. Um, and it, it's in keeping with the other two, as you can imagine. And oh, we just, it's perfect, isn't it? So it's a futuristic, um, cityscape look, which, uh, you can see from the top of Mount Mongare or, um, Mongafo. So, um, which forms an important part of our story. So pretty exciting. I think you can almost see a coro pattern in, in the sky there if you look carefully too, which I really like about it. So pretty striking stuff. All right. Well, let me just take that down. All right. So we're going to we, so we're going to kick off um, about we're about a third of the way into the story where we where we start this excerpt and and so far the day has not gone terribly well for um, for Penny and Matthew. Uh, there's been there's been a crime has taken place on the on on the Auckland wharves. Uh, there have been lots of bodies to clean up. Uh, and then, unfortunately, Auckland was also hit by a fairly significant earthquake. So while they are reeling from these things, they get another call um, to go and help uh, process another crime scene which has taken place on Mount Mangere, and that's where we are travelling right now. So I'll turn it over to I'll turn it over to Lee to start with Pandora's side of the story. Thanks, Dan. Penny and Matthew exchange uneasy glances. There's nowhere to park. The grass verges crammed with cars, so Matthew slows, looking both ways, searching for a spot. To Penny's left, Mount Mangare pokes its grassy knobbled sh shoulders above the modest suburban streets. Penny knows the domain well, occasionally walking the track to the top, sometimes bringing Cerberus for a romp on the terraces. There's plenty for him to explore, the double cratered hillock is humped and hollow, scattered with lava bombs thrown out during the mountain's last epic eruption 70,000 years ago. Still evidence of the original path site too. Penny can only imagine what it must have been like to live up there in those days, 
like living alongside the gods. The views will have changed over time, from lush bushlands to today's vibrant cityscape, but breathtaking nonetheless. You can see forever up there, across the city Taranga Piltu Island in one direction, and over to Pukitutu Island to the Manakol Heads on the other. It's a special place, the kind where you can reach out and touch the heavens with your fingertips. All at once, Severus howls. Startled, Penny glances back. The dog has dropped into the footwell and is frantically trying to squeeze his gangly doggy body into the small space. Hackles raised, he bares his teeth and growls, the sound so desolate that Penny's marrow turns to jelly. What's up with him? Turning within the confines of his safety belt, Penny's reaching a hand back to ruffle his ears and reassure him when she catches sight of her aunt. Penny's heart seizes. Of Cerberus, Cerberus's boot, Malama can only be petrified. She's the living embodiment of the hollow-eyed figure in that munch painting. Gripping the fabric of her dress in white knuckle terror, Malama's mouth quivers in a soundless scream. Penny whips her eyes back to the front and grasps Matthew by the arm. Matthew, something's wrong with Malama. She trails off. Matthew's expression is the mirror image of her eyes. What's wrong with them all? Pen, Matthew's moan is full of agony and he's panting as if he's in pain. His eyes have a faraway look of longing or despair. Oh, Christ, they're going to hit a car. Penny grabs the wheel, swerving the Solaris away from the curb and back into the middle of the road. This is ridiculous. They have to get off the road or Matthew's going to get them all killed. She slaps her brother on the arm, willing him to snap out of it. Matthew, can you hear me? I need you to turn right. Go back a few streets. Find a space so we can stop. He blinks. Matthew, turn right now. Okay, he croaks. Thank goodness. He almost misses the junction, turning them sharply into a hasty ad. Nothing, still nowhere to part. The streets are chock full of cars, and Penny would bet her right arm that every one of them is unlocked and abandoned. Marlama groans. Matthew, Penny urges, go left into Crawford. Left here, turn. Finally, she spies a space up ahead. Fortunately, Matthew seems to have recovered at least partially because he manoeuvres the Solaris up onto the verge without being told. He puts the car in park, then throws open the door and rolls out onto the grass. Penny too is out of the car, rounding the back of the vehicle to check on Malama. The door open, Penny leans inside to comfort their aunt. Meanwhile, Cerberus is attempting to change footwell, his mother resting on Malama's leg. Matthew, you okay? Penny asks, while Malama clings to her like a wet swimsuit. What's going on? Her aunt mumbles something incoherent into Penny's shoulder. Penny feels her tremble. On his hands and knees now, Matthew shakes his head. Don't know, he gasps. Bit of food poisoning, I guess. Feeling better now. But Mum has got it too, and it hit her at exactly the same time. Using the Solaris for support, Matthew staggers to his feet. Milk must have been off, he moved round. Such a violent reaction from just a teaspoon of milk. And to hit that fast, Penny's doubtful. Matthew doesn't meet his eye, her eye instead gazing back down the road towards the mountain. The glare of sunshine on the white paint of the Solaris drives back the darkness, this well of black which was drawing him down. The sound of voices muffles the lingering, echoing scream that had come from nowhere, yet somewhere familiar, somewhere close, somewhere impossibly here. But that's all it was, a reflection, an echo, a glimpse of something darker, something they missed. The old volcano has borne brooding witness to many a horror in its long lifetime, and today its very bones have cried out with the pain of whatever new atrocity has taken place under her watchful eye. Taking a deep breath, Matthew pulls himself together, fingers drumming a rhythm on the bonnet. He turns as Madama wraps him in a hug, her thin arms brittle as firewood as she draws him close, and then she is gone and the sun hammers down, and the scream still echoes, distant in his head, calling. Like somewhere a window has cracked open, and from the darkness beyond comes a wind, cold and sour, and haunted by the voices of the ghosts who want to step through. It may not be wide enough for them yet, but they will howl and rage and scrape their fingers along the glass until it shatters. 
A patrol car pulls up alongside them and Penny is talking to someone and they're bundling into the car, Penny up front and Beaker in the back. Matthew gets in the Solaris, Cerberus bounding in behind him and, like he's falling into a dream, the car is driving. Turning up the sloping, winding road which he knows will take them into the car park and the ranger track, up the wide, angry shoulders of a volcano which, like her many close relatives, merely slumbers here on the fringes of the human world. This place which is the domain of Ru'umoku, just one step between the shifting heat of the Earth's crust and the screaming dark of the underworld. It's all coming together, and it's all falling apart. Matthew shakes his head clear. This is no time to freeze up. Shit just got real. He needs to be on his game. He rolls the window down and lets the hot, fetid wind rush over him, tastes the anticipation, rolls it on his tongue, and grins a grin which just might be a little bit mad. Just a bit further. Stepping over the lip of the crater, she gazes down at the scooped out core and the sweat freezes on the back. Her breath freezes too, her chest wall constricting around her lungs. Oh my God, the speaker whispers beside her. Kitty sinks to her knees on the grass, breathing in rapid, shallow breaths. She hugs her arms about her. What's happening to the world? Two massacres in one day? How is it even possible? All these people, there has to be at least a hundred of them. Now she knows what the officer had meant about everyone arriving too late and why so many cars have been abandoned outside the community centre. Why haven't the police been told? Surely someone must have known this was about to happen. Penny's shock turns to anger. They knew and yet they chose to do nothing. The smallest clue would have been enough for Mira suits on to raising an arm. Why hadn't they phoned it in so the police could do their job? A text, a tweet, a hashtag. How even ten measly characters could have avoided all this, this waste? Except it isn't exactly the same as this morning. For one, the bodies don't appear to be mutilated. There was no sudden biofield explosion to fling butchered, dismembered limbs across a blistered tarmac. No, this was quietly done, in silence, without fanfare or fireballs. Teddy can tell because seen here from above, the bodies form a pattern laid out on the slopes in neatly concentric walls, increasingly tighter as they descend to the centre at the base of the hollow. Penny is certain they laid themselves out this way. They did it voluntarily. She doesn't need to look to know they all have the same motif tattooed on the inside of the wrist. Concentric walls like a stylized column with a slash across the meridian, the emblem of the touching the sun pulse. An airy Ululation echoes over the domain, and Penny looks up as Matthew and Cerberus come over the brow of the hill. The fern is a plant of special significance to the people of Aotearoa. Represented by the kuru, a curling inward spiral, it is a humble inhabitant of the bush with dark fronds that turn in on themselves and only occasionally uncurl when the sun hits them through the shade of the trees they hide beneath. Over the centuries, it has come to represent the country's sense of nationhood, an iconic swirl gracing the jerseys of national sports teams, government departments, and the tail fins of the now defunct state airline. It symbolises pride, unity, humility and endurance, survival. Matthew had never realised how much the symbol means to him as a New Zealander, as Māori, until he stands on the lip of the crater, looking down into the moor of Mount Mangere, and sees that symbol laid out below him in flesh and bone, a corruption, a spiral of death descending into the grassy centre of the, dormant's vol the dormant volcano's cone. Side by side, arms linked at the elbows, dozens of corpses stare blindly at the scorching sky. The koru means life, renewal, rebirth, not death, not this. Cerberus winds and strains against his leash as Matthew wanders along the perimeter tape, a ritualistic killing, the touching the sun wheatgrass juice, the bizarre symbology. It's got cur written all over it. But she's upped her game, or morphed it into something new. Not a single victim in a secret place, 
but a crowd out in the open at a place where the line between this world and the realms of Ru'umuku and Hinunuetipo grows thin. There's a roar building in the back of his neck, a rushing white noise like an approaching waterfall, its current drawing him closer to the edge and the plummet into oblivion. He fights back the urge to let it draw him in. He needs to focus now, and focus hard. The fingers of his left hand drum against his leg, thrum, 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 a rhythmic counterpoint to the thunder of the beyond. A quiet challenge. The roar recedes, but only slightly, just enough to choke back the scream rising in his throat, a desperate howl he had barely heard, even though it's coming from his own lungs. He stifles the cry, withering under the odd stairs, drifting his way. At the very centre of the spiral, in what must have been the throat of the volcano several thousand years ago, there's a gap. Matthew can practically see Sandy Kerr there, standing over her lambs, the shepherd holding the sacrificial knife, asking them, no, telling them, to give their lives for whatever it is the mad woman seeks, a gate to another world, or the open jaws of a being as dark and vast and hungry as the night itself. Yeah, I think there's a reason why you're doing the audiobook version and not me. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh, I can't wait for this book to come out in November. It's, it was so fun to write, wasn't it? It was really good. Yep, it was a blast. It was a blast. It was a um, great, great way to end the series. Actually, it's um, it's it's been a, it's been a fun journey all the way. Um, books one and two were were, were, were their own things, and and they uh, they certainly were were a, a good part of the journey. And um, but it was it's been really nice to wrap it all up in in, in this one. So, um, so if you can, if you can um, get out there and find it at the library, um. By all means, um, I would love love to uh, love you to read it and uh, and let us know what you think. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of people doing it hard with the pandemic. So please use your library if you can't afford to buy a copy or get an ebook. Absolutely, ask for it at the library. It really helps out authors, particularly in this really tough time. So it's a really good idea. Also, ask for these ones. These are dance books. Don't forget, Children of Bay his series, and I'd love it if you pick up one of mine as well. I have the Tame McKenna Adventure Series, so these are sort of um, books that are set in New Zealand National Parks military thrillers. Thanks very much uh, for joining us on tonight's um, Wellington uh, Storytime for Grown Ups, and um, really great to be here, and uh, um, we hope you enjoy the rest of the series. Thanks for letting us, thanks for letting us scare you. <laughs> no, no, Good night, I... everyone. Bye bye.